Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining for another week. We are now in year two of producing content for my whole baby making plan. In college, my gay best friend and I joked that if we hadn't found love by 40, we'd have a baby with each other. 20 years later, I'm pulling the ripcord. From deciding on solo motherhood to choosing IVF, I'm Meredith, and this is The Backup Plan. It's wild. I can't believe it. I talked about it a little bit last week because there have been stops and starts along the way that I didn't expect, and I definitely thought at this point I would have a little baby in my arms. But I don't, but we're getting close, and that's what counts. So I thought that in starting the first episode of the second year of content, I would take a look back at the last year and let you guys know where I'm at, where we're going, where we've been. If you have started listening anywhere within the last year and and maybe weren't caught up on what happened before, this is the perfect place to start. So welcome. Everything started in about 2022, the end of 2022. I had gone through a whole time, as had we all during COVID. My dad was diagnosed with cancer the week that Trump was inaugurated. So that whole presidency term was pretty tough for me and my family. And he passed away during COVID. During that time, I was just so focused on taking care of my family, taking care of myself. I had been in a very deep funk for about two years. That whole COVID period, obviously we were all in a funk, but um, you know, with my dad being as sick as he was, Trump being in office, the Black Lives Matters protest happening, the after effects of Me Too and still feeling like less than as a woman. I would say also the socioeconomic case of me being somebody in her 20s living in Los Angeles, very, very difficult. Coming up and out of that, I just wasn't sure that bringing a child into the world was the greatest idea. My nephew had been born and I kind of looked at him as like the bloodline continuing and me feeling fine about it. But in the year after my dad passed, my mom and I bought this beautiful house together and I stopped living in survival mode and started living in this place of what is my next chapter? What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? And that was when my therapist said to me, take the elevator from your head to your heart. Stop thinking about all the ways it can go wrong or all the reasons why you don't want to do something or a pros and a cons list. And just tell me what you're feeling instinctively in your heart. And that was when I said to myself, I've always wanted to be a mom. And I think there are ways to do this within my moral compass. So that was when I chose to start down this path. So 2022 is really that time where I started to breathe and become myself again. Am I there fully? No, no, not yet. But (laughs) we're, we're getting there. In April of 2022, I decided to get my foot fixed. And that was a huge deal because that had been bothering me for a really long time. And I feel like that was kind of the marker of like, all right, we're we're moving forward uh, within the whole like medical system and taking care of our bodies, taking care of ourselves. And in August, Michael and I reconnected after having not talked for a little while. COVID kind of shook some things up between us. And I'm so grateful we reconnected because, you know, I love him dearly and he is... He is another part of me. I had been thinking about having a kid on my own, but I didn't want to do it with donor sperm. I just knew that that wasn't the path for me. That just didn't feel right in my story, especially considering Michael and I had joked about having a kid together forever. And even though we'd had a little bit of a falling out during COVID, it didn't mean I didn't still love him and care about him deeply and want him to be a part of my life forever. Um, not necessarily in this like very permanent way that I'm describing right now, but uh, that was the that was the direction my brain was going in. So Michael came to visit in August of 2022, and I said to him, "You know, I I'm thinking I want to have a kid and I want to do it on my own." And without even asking, he said, "Well, you know, I donate, right?" So. That was how all of this started. In November, Michael and I took a trip together. He had a business trip in Seattle, and I always wanted to see it. So I flew up there, and we talked about it more. This isn't necessarily a situation where you say to somebody, hey, can I use your sperm? Okay, great. We'll donate tomorrow, and and wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. At least not in my case. For me, I had to like sit with it and get used to the feeling and the idea. And so in November in Seattle, I remember having a couple of conversations with Michael and it wasn't going the way I wanted it to. I realized that his idea of donation was different from my idea of donation and the participation I wanted was different from what he was envisioning. So there had to be a little bit of adjustment there. 
I thought during that trip that maybe things were going to be off and they weren't going to work, but I didn't abandon the idea, and I'm obviously very glad that I didn't. So during the holiday season of 2022, things kind of petered along the way that they were, and in the new year, I started preparing my body for what I was getting ready for. I went to my GP in February and said, I want to come off of Celexa, the antidepressant that I was on, because I had this idea that... I needed to be totally clean and have a fresh temple to raise my little embryo in. And I thought I was good. I thought I didn't need Celexa. I thought after, you know, taking care of my dad and going through his passing, a year had passed. I was feeling pretty stable and good. I was ready to come off of it. And my doctor helped me come up with a tapering plan, which I started instituting in February. In March, I went to an OBGYN. I did a lot of research and I found one um, in Orange, which is not far from where I live, and let them know my plan. I remember being extremely nervous that they were going to be like, you plan on having a baby with your gay best friend? Like, that's a terrible idea. Also, my plan at that point was to do the baby making via turkey baster. Um, (laughs) Not an actual turkey baster, but a syringe, but the turkey baster method, right? That was what we joked about all the time. And I was like, maybe it's full circle. Maybe this is the way I have a baby. Going to the doctor and telling them I wanted to do it DIY, I was really nervous that I was going to be met with some sort of negative reaction. And no, they were great. The midwife that I met with who conducted my cervical exam said, no, just make sure that when he comes, keep it in the cup close to his body. And that way you lose less sperm in the transfer process. And I was like, oh, okay. At this point in the world, something very big happened, especially if you're a Bravo fan. Um, What would come to be known as Scandval occurred. And and Ariana Maddox is one of my closest friends. I was there for her through that. And in March, that I would say that was a pretty devastating event. And having that coincide with me coming off of antidepressants was... A th- uh, it was a thing. <laughs> um, you know, I remember when it all happened and I considered him to be a very close friend. So I took it personally and it was just like loss on top of loss on top of loss on top of my brain readjusting to dopamine and, and serotonin and, and what have you. So that was difficult. And I had already purchased my tickets to go to Alaska to meet Michael to try this DIY method. And When I look back at that time now, like I was so heavily affected. I didn't think I was. I thought I was fine. No, I was slowly falling into depression. So then in April, I fly to Alaska and I've totally come off of my antidepressants at this point. I'd been fine, but having it totally out of my system at that point, I crashed hard and I had like a ton of anxiety attacks while I was up there. I questioned everything I was doing. I, I... Actually, I ended up flying home a day early because I just wanted to be back in my safe environment so badly. And I had planned on us trying a couple of times up there and it didn't happen. We just did the one time and it didn't work. When I look back at it now, I may have had a chemical pregnancy because there were some things that my body did and I felt a little wonky, but you know, it didn't happen. And ultimately that's for the best because there was definitely, there were some mental hurdles I had to get over in the meantime. So summer of 2023, what did that look like for me? I mean, I lived, honestly, I went to two different music festivals. I went to governor's ball. I went to life is beautiful. I hung out with friends. I got back on my antidepressants, but I had a good time. And I'm really glad that I did because it just got my head back to the right place. So that come October, I looked at the calendar. I did some alignment and said, okay, here's what I'm going to be ovulating. Michael was moving to Spokane, Washington at that point. And so I was excited to go see him there because Fairbanks, Alaska is just not my jam. I went to see him in his new place. He had a gorgeous little apartment and we had a good time just walking around the city. He took me to Idaho. I've never been to Idaho, so got to see Kurt Elaine. And we had a nice time and we did a couple of DIY attempts there. I came away from that feeling really good, feeling like we accomplished something and we didn't. Nothing happened, even though we did, I think it was four different DIY attempts that time. 
we got, I got really comfortable with that little sample cup. And we actually, we devised a method where he would leave the sample cup and I would go get it. So there was never a handing of the sample cup because that's the awkward, it's just awkward. So at this point, I was kind of faced with a calendar dilemma because the next time that I ovulated was going to be very close to me heading out of town on a huge European adventure with my mom. Super excited about that. We were taking a European river cruise through Christmas markets, um, Germany, Switzerland, France. Like, I was so excited. I didn't know if I should try again so close to traveling even though my A number one thing is to get pregnant, having this trip planned so close to the ovulation, I just, I didn't know what to do. There was enough time to either fly Michael down or for me to fly up, but again, it's another expense, so close to a big expensive trip. And Michael said to me, you know what? Go have fun. Go have a good time. Don't worry about it. Because if you get there and you're not pregnant, that's going to be upsetting. If you get there and you do get pregnant, if you have seasickness, morning sickness, like just have a good time. And so I decided to do that. Coming back home from that would have put me in another kind of awkward schedule of trying to get either to Michael or get him here right around the holidays. And so it's like, okay, well, we'll try again in January. It was also in November that I had my first appointment at Kind Body. For those who don't know, Kind Body is a great fertility clinic. I really love their ethos. I love the people who are running the place. And I've had a really great experience in going there. So definitely check them out. I thought to myself at this point... I just want to get things checked out. I know I've only tried twice technically, but I don't know. I was 38 at this point and I just wanted to cross my T's and dot my I's and make sure everything was fine. So that was my first kind body appointment. Things were looking pretty good as far as testing goes. Through December, I went and I had a couple different kind body appointments, and that puts us in 2024. In January, I was doing all this testing, getting my blood drawn, having transvaginal ultrasounds to check out the inner workings. And at that point, I had a saline bubble study where I don't know exactly how they perform this test, but I know that bubbles being shot up into your uterus is part of it. And I was told it would be just a little bit uncomfortable. It ended up being a lot uncomfortable, not painful, just uncomfortable. This was January. And while I was in the trailer that we were visiting, because Kind Body's office hadn't opened yet, I said to my doctor, I just want to have a baby. I just want a little baby in my arms. And at this point, that saline bubble study had not given us conclusive results. I was feeling a little bit defeated. And she said to me, you know, IVF is an option if you want to consider it. And something changed for me at that point. I had a talk with my mom and within honestly like an hour or two, I decided that I wanted to go the IVF route. This is wild for me because I had never considered IVF before. I had actually kind of been against it because to me, it felt like playing God. It felt like to the way my brain had been operating, it's like, well, if it's not happening, it's not happening for a reason. And since then, obviously my whole world has changed and I think about IVF in a completely different way. It's not playing God because there's still so many different hurdles you have to get over. And there's so many ways that like miracles are still happening with IVF. And it's not a straight shot. It's not like, oh, I didn't have a baby, so I'll do IVF. And now it worked. And now I have a kid. It's not like that at all. There's so many different steps along the way. I love the personal growth that I've had on this IVF journey. That also felt easier because... Towards the end of 2023 there, it was like, okay, well, I'll fly up to see Michael or he'll fly down to see me. And then the next month we'll, we'll do the opposite. And, and still it's me who's shelling out all the money for the plane tickets. And at this point I was just like, you know what, if we fly him down here and we get a whole bunch of donations out of him, we're good to go. So let's just do it that way. So Michael actually donated for me on Valentine's day. So cute. Like the most romantic thing you can do for a friend. <laughs> And like, I was all ready to go right there. And then like next month, I wanted to hit it and do the egg retrieval and start the process. But I started having more problems with my foot. So in between having the surgery in 2022, and now we're in early 2024, I had had cryo surgery done as well, because I was having some nerve pain in my foot that was exacerbated by the bunion surgery. So my bunion had been fixed and that felt better, but the nerve pain now was worse. I was all ready to go and start retrieving eggs in March, but it was evident that I had to have something done about this nerve pain because it was 
wildly painful to the point that I had to call my mom to come pick me up places I had just like gone and walked to for the afternoon. It was it was really bad. So I elected to have this nerve removal done then. So I had this foot surgery done in March. And in April, I did my first round of egg retrieval. That egg retrieval didn't go as well as I wanted it to have. I was feeling really good about it. I went into it thinking, I don't have fertility issues. I'm just doing IVF. Uh, Maybe I have fertility issues. Or maybe again, it's not playing God. It's just like the way it was meant to go. It just didn't work. And I had a long talk with my mom about it. She's helping to finance this process. And so she said, let's do another egg retrieval. I will put a link up in the corner for you to check out the results from my two different egg retrievals. I didn't really do anything too different between the two of them. I ate chicken the second round because I thought maybe I need some protein. That was the biggest difference between the two and a slightly different medication routine. But other than that, they were pretty much the same. The first egg retrieval, I got two embryos out out of it, one which was usable and the other was not. The one that was usable, though, was segmented mosaic, and I just didn't feel great about that. My second egg retrieval was done in June of 2024. I got two eggs that both tested completely normal with the PGTA testing, and one of those I'm going to use for my implantation next month. And then finally, just last month in July, I had my embryo reveal. I was going back and forth about whether or not I wanted to know the gender of my embryos, And ultimately decided that gender reveal parties are outdated, but embryo reveal parties, it's the new frontier, guys. So I had a really cute moment where we learned the sex of all of the embryos at once. It went a little awry because I screwed things up and then Party City screwed things up. But don't worry about it. It's totally fine. We had a great time. If you want to see some real tomfoolery, I highly recommend going back and checking that video out. Now we're all caught up. The only other minor thing that happened between the embryo reveal and now is I had a breast cancer scare and a lumpectomy. Don't worry about it. Uh, I would have had the embryo implanted this month, but because of all that, we just wanted to make sure everything was cool and clear and everything looked good. But I visited a breast surgeon who said, let's just take it out because what you have in there, it's not cancerous as far as we can see, but it could become cancerous. And if we can't watch it, for the next two years or so, because you're having a baby and then breastfeeding. And then if you want to have another baby and then you breastfeed that baby, like we could be talking about four years of not monitoring it. So let's just take it out now. Really glad I did. The recovery has been pretty easy, but Hey, I don't want to talk about breast cancer anymore. (laughs) I want to talk about implantation. Look what I got. ASMR. This is my old friend, Estradiol. Estrace is the other name for it. I'm going back on estrogen in probably a week and a half and then getting ready for implantation, getting ready for all those progesterone and oil shots. I'm super stoked. I can't wait. Um, I have had so many stops and starts along the way. I think I've had my fill of them. I think from here on out, it's going to be smooth sailing. I'm going to manifest that. Manifest it with me, please. (laughs) I feel like making this video is a fresh start. It's like, here's everything that we did. Here's everything we're about to do. And when I say we, I literally mean like you too, because you're watching this. It really feels like I'm making this baby with a village. It doesn't feel like I'm doing it on my own or with some boring heterosexual man. Um, (laughs) I I just, I really like this process. It's not at all what I thought it was going to be. And... I feel really good about where I'm going and what autumn holds for me. I'm going to have a little pumpkin spice embryo. So thanks again, guys. Please follow on social media. Please subscribe here. I'm putting out videos every Wednesday at the moment. That may change. I may be adding some more videos. We'll see. I've got some plans. Thanks for hanging out. Have a great week. And next week, I'll see you. And we can talk all about the shots I have to give myself. Yay! The Backup Plan is created, produced, and hosted by me, Meredith Kate. Julian Hagens is my co-producer. You can find us on social media at Backup Plan Pod. The best place to get updates is to sign up for our newsletter at BackupPlanPod.com, where we also post all episodes, show notes, and transcripts. Thank you for listening.